Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. This morning, and welcome everyone watching online through our YouTube live channel. And I ask you all watching by YouTube live at this time to gather around your children as well to, uh, to pray over your children. Hallelujah. And, uh, Mark, can I ask you to pray for our children? Thank you. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your power, for your presence, for your anointing upon the worship and upon your service. I pray, Lord, your anointing upon the children that they would be able to soften and hear your word of love, your word of encouragement, and your word to uh, point them in the direction of becoming more and more like Yeshua every day. Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your kindness and for your mercy. And we pray for your blessing in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Children you who, will go, who are going to class can be, leave through these side doors. Uh, the parents do not need to go with them. The teachers will escort them. Uh, and then if you're st not going to the class, you can, be, you can go back to your seats with your parents. Right, if you're ready in the back. Okay. Let's wait till the door closes here. All right, well, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, we are in and have been uh, for some time now in, in a series on the fruits of the Spirit. Today is part eight. And so far, we, we've looked at love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And today, we're looking at goodness. And to, get it, and to get at this theme, I want us to look at a famous passage uh, on what is good. So turn with me to Micah chapter 6, Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. Uh, and, and the prophet Micha, Micah, uh, says this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? As you know, if you've been here for other parts of this series, the overall theme of the series is that the inner character traits that are described by the fruit of the Spirit are the result of a supernaturally changed heart, not just a, a morally restrained heart. And today we're looking at the fruit of goodness. Uh, and by the way, in almost no one today in our culture or in our society thinks that people are becoming more and more good. Almost nobody thinks believes that. In fact, our society seems to be facing greater and greater and more increasing darkness. Almost no one says we're becoming more good. Indeed, even the New York Times, believe it or not, <laughs> there's been some interesting articles recently. Uh, one of them is called, Web Trolls Winning as Incivility Grows. <laughs> Another New York Times article is entitled, Dealing with Digital Cruelty. <laughs> And we've seen this in spades, of course, over the last four years, as people have savagely attacked public figures that they dislike. Uh, and our social media, guardians of the galaxy, <laughs> they almost never censor any of this stuff. They love the vitriol, as long as their side's ox is not being gored. And if you read these New York Times articles, uh, and the overhead here, the main takeaways are these two themes, interestingly. Number one, there's a lot of darkness in the human heart. The human heart is capable of tremendous cruelty and evil. And number two, 
If anything pulls the social pressure away, pulls away what had kept these evil impulses down uh, and hidden and private, if these restraints are released, the evil quickly explodes. And the, and the anonymity of the internet is promoting this uh, and allowing it to be unleashed without restraint. You cannot believe the vile stuff uh, that's freely said today on Twitter and Facebook and internet blogs. You want to say, what's wrong with these people? Well, they're just people. People exhibiting the natural evil of their fallen state. As Paul says, Romans 1.21, uh, their thinking became futile and the foolish hearts were darkened. And on the internet, again, the, the anonymity makes it possible for you to say things you otherwise would never feel free to say. Another great example of this lack of, of goodness uh, and the human heart is the, uh, William Golding's uh, famous novel, The Lord of the Flies. Uh, this used to be required reading in every high school. The novel depicts what happens when a group of very civilized English schoolboys are shipwrecked on an island. And when all the social pressure of civilization is off, they quickly descend into savagery. The natural human nature, the will to power, the capacity for cruelty, it all quickly comes out. And this is, on the overhead here, this just drives home the point that what we as human beings need is not improvement. We need redemption. We don't need to become nicer people. We need to become new people. Now, when the Bible talks about goodness, when, when the word good is used, including here in, in the book of Micah, uh, it means something much more radical than what the English word good usually denotes, uh, which is a kind of bland niceness. And if you want, if you want to understand what the, what the Bible means by good, you have to first ask a very important question. Uh, this famous passage here in Micah 6 uh, starts with a question. Uh, and according to the Bible, it's the greatest question anyone can ever ask. The most important question you can pose. So this passage, it starts with a question, and then it gives us two wrong answers, and then it gives us the right answer. So in the overhead, let's look at number one, the great question. Number two, the wrong answers to the question. And then number three, uh, the right answer. So number one, the great question. Micah 6, verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the God on high? With what shall I come before the Lord? That to come before someone, to come into their presence, is in Hebraic terminology, means to stand in relationship to them. It means I'm in a relationship with you. But Micah says, what shall I do to stand before the exalted God, the God on high? Uh, that's the question. How can I have a relationship with a transcendent, uh, this, this exalted God? How can I come into his presence? Uh, how can I know him? Uh, and all ancient cultures believed that behind uh, the immensities of the universe, of the natural universe, was an even greater immensity, uh, uh, the ultimate mystery, a divine, transcendent, ultimate, absolute power. That behind the natural universe, there was a transcendent, absolute, divine power. Uh, and all ancient cultures believed that we were very small before this power. Uh, that God is eternal, we're mortal. Uh, God is immense, we're small. Uh, God is infinite, we're finite. God is pure and holy, and we are flawed and sinful. Uh, and God, God he, can, he can see the end from the beginning. Uh, he can see all things in time and space, we can only see a little bit. And therefore, all ancient cultures believed there was this enormous gap uh, between us and the divine, uh, a chasm. And that's why all ancient cultures had temples, uh, because nobody believed you could just automatically come into the presence of this divine transcendence. You could just talk to this power on your own. Uh, there was a gap, a chasm. Uh, and the distance had to be mediated uh, by priests uh, and sacrifices and rituals and, and, and temples and ceremonies. No one thought you could just snap your fingers uh, and talk and have a conversation with this great transcendent power. No. There's this huge gap. that we And we have to bridge this gap somehow. Now today, we are the first culture in the history of the world to completely lose the sense 
of that, dis of that distance between us and the transcendent God. We completely lost the idea uh, of a distance that there's this huge gap. Now, now, most people in America, according to the polls, uh, say they, they believe in God. According to a recent poll, only 3% identify as atheists and 4% as agnostics. So only about 7% say they don't believe in God. 93% claim they do. And yet, the sociologists who have studied the religious views in America, and especially the views of, of younger Americans, uh, there's, there's, an, there's an overwhelming, obvious idea uh, this overwhelmingly obvious idea of, of this transcendent God, this unscrutable God, uh, this God to whom we owe everything, and, and he owes us nothing, a God who's infinitely holy and sovereign, has the right to do with us as he pleases, uh, that that God, the biblical God, that is not the concept that, of the average American of who God is, and especially not for the millennial and, and younger generations. We believe in a God the surveys say. Uh, yes, we believe in, in God, but the idea of there being this gap, that this God who's transcendent, that there's this chasm, something has to be done to, to bridge this distance, to, to mediate the distance, that's out of there. Uh, the average American does not believe that. Because when people, you know, they say they believe in God, they often mean they believe in a spirit of love. Uh, a God who really, really doesn't care how you live, but who'll always be there if and when you call upon him. Uh, and you can just talk to this God at any time, under any circumstances, and, and he'll help you. And the ancients sort of looked at us modern people and said, you're crazy. <laughs> and yet you're being logically inconsistent. Think about this. Do you believe there's a God who created this world? The average American says, yes. Uh, well, well, look at the world then. Uh, look at the oceans and the mountains and the overwhelming fire at the heart of the planet. Uh, look at the stars and the infinite number of galaxies. Look at the immensities of, of the universe. If there's a God who created all of this, who sustains all of this every second of every minute of every day, is that the kind of person you can just waltz in and talk to? Just go right in, maybe a little bit of meditation. Is this the kind of God who somehow owes you to make sure that your life goes well? Would you look at all the universe and conclude that God was just a warm, fuzzy spirit of love? Nonsense. Nonsense. The question that Micah asks, which is the question that's kind of incomprehensible now to the average American, but it's not incomprehensible today to most people of the world, and, and most people in the world in the, and most people in the history of the world was certainly not incomprehensible. The question is this: this exalted sovereign God. How in the world can I have a relationship with him? How can I, a finite, flawed, sinful, limited person, how is it possible for me to come into a relationship with a great and, and exalted God? That's the question Micah poses. So on the overhead, number one, that's the great question. And put this on the overhead, thank you. And then, so number two, Micah next gives us two wrong answers. Micah 6, uh, six and 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and, and bow down before the God most high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, uh, with the yearling calves, calves a year old? Will the Lord be, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, uh, with 10,000 rivers of oil? And of course, these are rhetorical questions. The answer is no. Uh, uh, this or at least this alone will not give you a relationship with the Lord. But here's what Micah is really saying between the lines. He's saying all the wealth in the world would not suffice as a burnt offering. Uh, now, what's a burnt offering? Well, well calves a year old were very expensive. Uh, cows were, were very costly. And, and yearling calves, very tender, even, even more valuable. Thousands of rams, of course, would, even, be, even, would be even a more expensive offering. And 10,000 rivers of oil, which means olive oil, uh, that would be like millions, maybe billions of gallons <laughs> and, and, and billions of dollars. I mean, how do, we even how do you even conceive of, let alone measure, a river of oil? It's almost like he's saying, if I could bring you all the wealth on the planet, Lord, would that suffice as my burnt offering? 
Now, according to Leviticus, uh, burnt offerings, uh, the ola offering is the, is the word here in Hebrew. Uh, these were not ways to atone for sin. Uh, these were not sin or guilt offerings. These whole burnt offerings, they were different. Uh, these were free will offerings. These were thanksgiving offerings and offerings of dedication to the Lord. And they were wholly consumed in the fire. Uh, whole burnt offerings as a way of expressing one's entire dedication to God. The Lord told Abraham to offer Isaac, using the same Hebrew word, as an olah, uh, as a whole burnt offering, as a way of demonstrating Abraham's total commitment uh, to the Lord. Burnt offerings were therefore symbolic of giving your whole life to God. And so in our passage here, Micah is saying, what if I just gave my whole life? What if I said, here's all my wealth, here's all I am, here's everything, uh, I'm going to live for you, Lord, uh, I'm going to surrender to you uh, everything, would that suffice? Would that merit a relationship with you, Lord, the exalted God? And of course, my God says the answer is no. Now, now we Americans, we tend to believe that everyone's got his price, right? <laughs> that anybody can be bought. But Micah is saying, not this God. <laughs> and then he moves on. Micah, he asks uh, an even more outrageous question. Look at uh, verse 7. Micah 6, verse 7. Uh, in the overhead. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now here he's not talking about a burnt offering this time. It's clear he's talking here about, about an actual sin offering. Uh, uh, korban hata'at in Hebrew. He says, shall I offer this as my transgression, for, for my transgressions, for my sins? You know, in the Torah, sacrificial system, when you sinned, you brought a sin offering or a guilt offering to atone for the transgression. Uh, now, if you've wronged someone uh, you, and you felt guilty about it, what do you do? Well, you, you go to him, you go to her, you say, is there anything I can do to put this right? Is there anything I can do to atone for what I've done? Now, if what you've done to the person is, is not enormous, sometimes, sometimes, yes, it is possible to, to pay a price to a so-called atone for your sin, if you will. Uh, if it's a minor thing and you cost them some minor loss, it's possible for you to pay for it and actually to, to make up for it. You can atone for your sin uh, in that sense. But many times what we do, even just on our human level, if we harm their reputation, if we cost them a, a, a relationship, if we get them fired from their job, uh, if we betray them, there are many ways we can really hurt someone really sin against them, and there is no price you could pay to undo the damage. But here, first of all, Micha, Micah, he's saying, let me come up with the most unimaginable pain that I can think of. How about the pain of losing your firstborn son? Unimaginable pain, terrible pain. And, and the overhead, Micah's saying, even if I were to voluntarily offer up that which is most precious to me, up to the Lord, Oh, the greatest personal pain and agony in the world would not atone for my sin. Why not? Because a sin against an infinite God is an infinite debt. God created you. He keeps you alive every second. So you owe him your life millions of times over. How many seconds have you had in your life? And because we live as if we own ourselves, which is a form of cosmic treason, a cosmic rebellion against the Lord, our maker, our sin is far too great for us to ever atone for. And so the two wrong answers are, is there a way I can surrender my life and live for the Lord? Uh, would that do it? No, all the wealth in the world wouldn't serve as a burnt offering. Or is there a kind of pain I could inflict upon myself in order to atone for my sin against God? Again, no, all the personal pain and agony in the world would not atone for your sin. And what this means is there's nothing that you can do to merit or warrant a relationship with this exalted God. But this is still something the average person doesn't believe. Most Americans, especially most younger Americans, say, if I can live a good life, uh, according to my standards, and I try my best, God will love me, God will answer my prayers, God will take me to heaven when I die. But Micah says no. It doesn't work this way. You don't understand how big God is or how flawed you are. So we have this great question. 
how can I come before God, have a, a relationship with his, this exalted, sovereign God? And, and, uh, we've, and we've seen the, the wrong answers. Now, number three on the overhead, uh, here's the right answer. It's in verse 8. But if we're going to understand verse 8, which is, by the way, one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible, we first need some background. So look at verse 8, Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. Now, if you take this out of context, it could look like he's saying, hey, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to do all these offerings and things like that. Just try your best. Live a good life. Be merciful to others. Uh, be just. And walk humbly with your particular God. Taking it out of context, this could, you could read this to say, everyone's got to decide what kind of God you believe in. You have your God. I have my God. Just walk humbly with your God. Taken out of context, the verse just says, you figure out what you think God is like, and what you think is right, what you think is wrong, and just live according to that standard. And that's all that God requires. Easy peasy. <laughs> now, have you ever had anything you said taken out of context? How did it make you feel? You know how infuriating that is. Well, you, well, you said this, yes, but I also said that. And if you, you said th that, if you ignore that and take it out of context, you're twisting my words. And you can make me say the exact opposite of what I've really said. And of course, we see this all the time today, don't we? You know, in the mainstream media and the so in social media, uh, where, they're, where they're very deceptive and very dishonest and very disingenuous using selective partial quotes. So you need to put the, a speech or a writing in context to get the meaning. And it's very upsetting when someone doesn't do that. So let's look at the context here of Micah 6, 8, and then go through the, the verse itself. Because the context tells us how to get a relationship with God. And then once we have this relationship, this text now tells us how to conduct that relationship. Now what, about, what do I mean by, by the context, the overall larger context? Well, look at the whole rest of the Hebrew scriptures. Micah is a Hebrew prophet. And if you think this is saying, you don't need to do any sacrifices, or you don't need to do these religious observances, just try your best to live the way you think is right. If you think that's what he's saying, it would contradict everything else in the Tanakh, everything else in the Old Testament scriptures. The Torah and the entire Hebrew scriptures say you do need atonement. You do need sacrifices. You do, do, do need blood atonement for your sin. It's not enough just to try to live a good life. Isaiah says, all your goodness, all your righteousness, your very best deeds are like a filthy rag before God. Look at Isaiah 46, verse 6. On the overhead, please. All of us have become like one who's unclean. On the overhead. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And when God gathered all of our people at Mount Sinai, he said, you are my people now. I brought you out of Egypt. I delivered you with my mighty hand and my outstretched arm. I rescued you from bondage. Now I'm bringing you to Mount Sinai to form a, for you to form a covenant with me, to be my people, for I to be your God. And the Lord says at Mount Sinai, I'm going to give you two things. Remember what they were? He gives us two things at Mount Sinai on the overhead. Uh, number one, he gives us the Ten Commandments. Gives us the law of God. Uh, here's how to live. And number two, he gives us the tabernacle uh, and the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Do you know why these two things? The Ten Commandments was the way in which God wanted us to live. God says, God says I want you to live this way. Okay. But then why did he also give us the tabernacle? Because he knew that we would not live this way. He knew no one was going to love the Lord, love his heart and soul and mind and strength, and love his neighbor as himself. And therefore, there needs to be atonement for our sins. And so you could read Micah 6 verse 8 as saying that you don't need atonement for your sins. You can read it as saying, Micah 6 verse 6 and 7 is simply saying, but, but what it's really saying, what Micah 6, 6 and 7, what it's really saying is that you can't do the atonement. You can't do the atonement but the atonement has to be there. Uh, you can't just simply say, well, I'm going to try my best. No. 
So the first context is that the scriptures are, says uh, there must be a sacrifice, there must be blood atonement for sin. There must be. And then secondly, when verse 8 says, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with the Lord, uh, that's the Old Testament's version of the two great commandments summarized in the Gospels, right? You know, Yeshua says the entire Torah boils down to this. Number one, love God. Walk humbly with your God. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Do justice. Love mercy. But in the New Covenant Scriptures, whenever Yeshua brings up these two great commandments, he never does it in order to say, see, just do your best and that will be enough. No. For example, he talks to the rich young ruler in Mark 10, who thinks he's pretty good, and Yeshua shows him he does not measure up to God's standards. Yeshua shows him he is not good. And therefore, he needs grace. And he needs mercy. He needs forgiveness. Uh, and in fact, even the most righteous one there in the New, in the new Covenant Scriptures, uh, Nicodemus, he still needs to be born again. And when the Torah experts ask uh, Yeshua uh, about the greatest commandments, look at Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. Uh, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Yeshua replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Yeshua lists the two greatest commandments to show the Torah expert that no one is keeping the Torah. No one is keeping the law. And he always mentions these two greatest commandments to show you you're not fulfilling the law. This is what the Lord requires. And if you think you're even coming close to fulfilling these requirements, you do not understand. In the early 18th century, the Methodist movement was born, headed up by John and Charles Wesley and uh, George Whitfield. The young men who founded this movement were really trying very hard to live up to the law of God. Now, when you read the Ten Commandments, most of it tends, at first glance, to be focused on, on outward behavior. You know, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. But then, then it says, don't covet which gets down into your heart. And when Yeshua, he sums up the commandments, he doesn't say just, just refrain from these outward obvious sins, but he says, I want you to affirmatively love the Lord your God. I want you to love the Lord so much that you will not covet. I want you to love your neighbor so much that you'll love them as if they were you. And when you begin to think out the implications of what those commandments really are saying, that yes, God, this is what God requires, but there, there's no way I can ever fulfill this requirement. And along those lines, I want to give you a set of questions that the early Methodists would use every night to look back on their day to see if they actually loved the Lord with all their heart and soul and mind and strength and their neighbor as themselves. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. In fact, I'm only going to give you about a third uh, of this list because you will not be able to bear it. It's on the overhead. Imagine looking back on your day, every night, before you go to bed, and asking yourself these questions. Have I not only prayed today, but been fervent in prayer? Have I practiced God's presence at least every hour, speaking directly to him? Have I, before every deliberate action or conversation, Consider how I might do it to God's glory in mind. Have I given thanks to God after each and every good thing I've experienced? Have I avoided proud thoughts? Have I avoided comparing myself to others? Have I always admitted when I was wrong, swiftly and happily? Have I thought or spoken unkindly of anyone? Now, this includes both any unkind thoughts or any unkind words towards anyone? Have I sought to center each conversation on the other person's needs? Or did I turn it towards myself and my needs or my interests? Did I ever twist the truth to look good? Have my words today, have my words today been honest, few, wise and apt, calm and warm? 
Have I harbored anxious thoughts? Or have I cast them all on the Lord, completely trusting in Him? Have I wasted my time? Or have I used it for the benefit of those around me or for my own spiritual growth? And the speaker broke off because they could bear it no more. That's just the beginning of thinking specifically exactly what it would mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Micah is saying here. That's what the Lord requires of you. And Yeshua likewise spells this out in the Sermon on the Mount. Anyone who says, well, I don't know if I believe in God or not, that's not what's really important. What's really important is you live a good life, you be a good person. I just try to live according to the Sermon on the Mount. You know, just try to be loving, accepting of others. Anyone who says this shows they have never really ever read the Sermon on the Mount. There's a famous British preacher, uh, Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones. He used to say, anyone who's thoughtfully read the Sermon on the Mount will cry out, God save me from the Sermon on the Mount. (laughs) Because there's no way you could possibly live up to that standard. So in the overhead. So if you put Micah 6 in context, you're going to see number one, your sin must be atoned for. It just can't be atoned for by you. And number two, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. This is exactly what God requires, but there's no way to fulfill this requirement rightly understood. But here's one more key point if you need to, under, if, if, if you need to understand if you want to put Micah in context. This illustration or this case study that Micah uses here in verse 7. Look at Micah 6 verse 7. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. This illustration is very significant. We probably flinch you know, when we read this. Uh, the, and we're, we're kind of appalled by this suggestion, aren't we? We read it and we say, well, that's just a figure of speech Micah's using. It's just a rhetorical device uh, for, for Hebraic emphasis. But it's not. Because when Micah uses this illustration, he's going back almost to the beginning of the Bible, and then he's looking forward to almost the end. This is the thread that shows us where the book of Micah fits in the overall narrative arc of the whole Bible. If you go back to the Mosaic Law, there's a very curious requirement that the life of the firstborn son of every family is forfeit because of that family's sin, and therefore a ransom has to be paid. Uh, five shekels of silver uh, to the priest, uh, to the tabernacle. The ceremony in Hebrew is called Pidyan Haben, uh, the redemption of the firstborn. We can read about it several places. Uh, we're going to look at it uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 13 on the overhead, beginning in verse 1, Exodus 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then verse down in verse 11, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the, belong to the Lord. Redeem with the lamb of your firstborn donkey, but if you don't redeem it, break its neck. And then also redeem every firstborn of your sons. So unlike the firstborn animals, none of the firstborn sons were to die. You did not break their neck. <laughs> Rather, they were to be redeemed. So the life of the firstborn of every family uh, is deemed forfeit and must be ransomed back. A price has to be paid. Now, here's what we don't understand because we live in the West, and today we are radical individualists. Uh, we live in the most individualistic society in the history of the world. The idea that the firstborn son gets all the inheritance in the ancient world, that seems really inequitable to us, right? But, that's, but, they, but back then, this was an era before there, were, there was really any money, for the most part. The average person didn't have money back then. Uh, yeah, of course, there were, and of course, there were no banks. There were no uh, systems of finance or, or investment uh, like we have today. Yeah, you had shekels, but, but by and large, things were, were not liquid. The assets uh, of a typical family, it was your land, uh, your house, uh, your crops, uh, and your livestock. And the only way for a family to maintain this position uh, in society 
is to not divide up your hard assets each generation. So instead, the firstborn son, on the death of the father, he became the head of the estate. And he was responsible for the care of his siblings. So the firstborn son represents the hope of the whole family. And when the Torah says the life of the firstborn son is forfeit, that you must pay a ransom, that was God's way of saying, you all deserve to die for your sins. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. God says, because of your sins, you all deserve to die. And the firstborn son, he's the federal head. He represents the, the whole family. And he's responsible for the whole family. And so you all deserve to die, but I'll accept a ransom. I'll accept a sacrifice. So the sin is atoned for. The ceremony of Pidyan Haben, the, the redemption of the firstborn, it was a symbol of the concept that the wages of sin is death. And this is the reason why one of the most famous stories of the Bible happened the way it did. Look at the famous story of the Akedah, the Akedah, uh, the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. Look at verse, Genesis 22, verse 2. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, Yitzhak, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as an olah, as a burnt offering on the mountain that I'll show you. This was excruciating, obviously, for, for Abraham. It was agonizing for Abraham. But notice he did not say, what are you talking about, God? Because he knew what God was doing. Or at least well, what Abraham thought that, that God was doing. was that God was calling in the debt. He was calling in the payment. For the sins of the family, the firstborn would die. So it wasn't a crazy idea for Abraham. Uh, it, it, was, it was an agonizing idea. Uh, but, but it simply seemed like God was, was calling in the debt. And so Abraham, he walks up the mountain, he gets to the top, he stretches out his hand, ready to, to sacrifice his son. And then you know the story at the last moment, Genesis 22, verse 11. The Malach Elohim, the angel of the Lord, calls out to him from, from, from Shemayim, from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, Hineni, here I am. He, he says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you have your lot Hashemayim, that you fear God because you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Great story. Abraham gets Isaac back. Abraham passes the test. He puts God first, even above his own son, his only son. But here's the real question Why did God descend? Why did God decide not to take the payment? Why did he decide not to take the payment for the sins of the family? Why didn't he take the firstborn's life? Because this verse in Micah 6, verse 7, about offering my firstborn for, uh, uh, for, the, for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul, this connects not only to the past, Genesis 22, but also connects uh, to the future, uh, to the gospel. The reason why God does not require your life uh, or my life the reason why he can forgive us, the reason why he doesn't require the life of the firstborn is because God the Father, as he walked up that same mountain, Mount Calvary, Mount Moriah, he walked up alone with his son, his only son, the one that he loves. And God the Father offers up his firstborn, his only begotten son. And there was no one to stay his hand Yeshua died on the tree, God's firstborn son, atoning for our sins, the atonement that only he could provide. And when you see Yeshua dying on that tree, you can now cry to the Father on the overhead, echoing Genesis 22. Now you can say, now we know that you love us. For you, Lord, did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. Only when you connect this passage in Micah to the beginning of the Bible and the ransom of the firstborn, Abraham and Isaac, and to the latter half of the Bible, to the Gospels, where God offers up his own firstborn son so that we could live, only then can you see how to have a relationship with God. Micah asks, how can I go before the God on high? Here is how. Pointing to the death and resurrection of Yeshua, trusting in his atonement on your behalf, saying, Father, accept me for, on the basis of what Yeshua has done. 
And now do you see what the phrase, your God, means? Micah 6, 8. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. It does not mean what the average modern person thinks it means. They think it means, uh, you have your God, I have my God. We just need to walk humbly, you know, uh, to follow our own God. No. When God spoke out of the burning bush, when God spoke out of the fire at Mount Sinai, he said, because I've already saved you by grace, because I've ransomed you from slavery before giving you the law, you know, I brought you forth out of Egypt, and then I gave you the Torah. Uh, so we aren't saved by, because we obey. We obey because we've already been saved by grace. And the Lord has, has put his spirit within us. And he's regenerated us, and he's made us new creations in Yeshua. And out of those new creation hearts, we joyfully now obey and serve the Lord. And so at time, I challenge you to look at your own heart today. Does it desire to obey and to serve and to live for the Lord your God? Are you growing in love and obedience and the fruit of the Spirit? If so, if so, that's a great sign that you have been regenerated. So at Mount Sinai, when the Lord says, because I've saved you by grace, and now you're my people, and I'm your God, now here are the rules I want you to live by. And now you can call me your God. Now I am your God. You see this term, your God, walk humbly with your God, means you're in a covenant with the Lord by grace alone. And if you're indeed in this grace-based covenant with the Lord, here are three final points. Here's what a, a, a relationship looks like if you understand now you're a sinner saved by grace. Now you can come into his presence on high and answer Michael's question. So on the overhead, number one, do justice, uh, act justly. Interestingly, this Hebrew word is the Hebrew word mishpat. Uh, it's almost always connected to four vulnerable classes in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, the widow, which I would suggest also includes single moms. Uh, the orphan, uh, the immigrant, uh, and the poor. This is biblical justice. Though that Micah says one of, the, one of the three key things that should mark your life if you are a believer is your commitment to help the most vulnerable and marginalized and powerless among us. And especially the widow and the orphan and the immigrant and the poor. Biblically, to act justly means to care for the poor, for the helpless, for the outcast, uh, for the marginalized, uh, the vulnerable, uh, the powerless. And we have a mercy fund here at Etzchayim. We set aside a minimum of 10% of our income every year for this very purpose, which is in addition to the, another 10% we set aside for missions and missionaries. But it's only as available as we have people who are able to donate, willing to donate to it. So every dollar you donate to Etzchayim, a portion of it goes to this mercy fund every year. The second imperative, Micah tells us, is to love mercy. The Hebrew word here is chesed, uh, love and kindness, steadfast love. It's use of God's unconditional love for us. It's covenant love. And Michael says that now we're supposed to also be characterized by this mercy and this chesed, this loving kindness towards others. We're to love mercy. We're to love to, li we, we're to, love to live like this. Uh, we're, we're to love our neighbor even when we're not getting anything out of it. You're committed to loving your neighbor even if, if, uh, if, if, they're, if, if, if uh, they're upsetting you. Uh, even if they're, they're letting you down. You don't give up on them. You stay in relationship with people even if they're a challenge to you at times. So number one, we're to act justly. Number two, we're to love mercy. And then number three, walk humbly with your God. What does it mean to walk? The Hebrew here is holech, from which we get the word halacha, you know, the way we should go, how we should live. Uh, to walk is a metaphor in the Bible because when you walk, several things are happening. Uh, to walk together means you're having a relationship with someone. Uh, you're talking to them, they're talking to you, you're going someplace together uh, to the same destination. So the overhead, Mike, when Micah tells us to walk with God, it means three things. It means, number one, you're exposed and totally vulnerable and accountable. So you're exposed and totally accountable. 
Number two, you're befriended and totally loved. And number three, you're growing and gradually changing. The way you know you're in a vital relationship with God, that you're walking with him, is first of all, you're exposed. When you're walking with someone, they can see everything you're doing. Uh, you can't hide on the overhead. To be exposed and totally accountable means every part of your life you voluntarily expose to God and ask him to hold you accountable, to search you, to know you, to show you any offensive way you have. You don't just let your shoe into part of your life. You're not one way at shul and another way at home behind closed doors. You bring your shoe into every part of your life. That's what it means to walk with God. And then second, you're befriended and totally loved. Walking in the Bible is a, is a metaphor for intimacy, which means, number one, you've got to have a prayer life. On the overhead, a two-way prayer life, where not only do you speak to God, but where God speaks to you, which is done primarily through his spirit, quickening his word in your heart. And you've got to have an actual palpable sense of his love on your heart in your life. That's what it means to walk with God. Is this true of your life? It means to have an experiential prayer life, like Chad talked about a few weeks ago. And I'll be all on the overhead. Thirdly, walking means, means growth. Uh, it means progress. It means you're changing. So ask yourself, am I more joyful than I was a year ago? Am I more loving, more peaceful uh, than last year? Am I more patient, more kind, uh, more humble, more self-controlled? Am I changing? Am I growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Examine yourself. You see, goodness isn't just some kind of bland niceness and the overhead. Uh, it's newness. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. God can make the feeblest and filthiest of us into dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating, all through with such joy and energy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. He can make us into bright stainless mirrors which reflect back onto God perfectly his own boundless power and delight and goodness. This process will be long and in part painful, but that's what we're in for. Nothing less. It's time to catch a vision today for newness of life, for walking with Lord Yeshua, your God. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Let the music team to come on up. Hallelujah. Our Father in heaven, we ask you today, Lord, we ask you for a supernaturally changed heart, one that desires goodness. We know, Lord, you tell us there's no one good but, but you, Lord. So we ask you to change us into your image. We don't, want, we don't need just improvement, Lord. We need redemption. We don't need to become nice people. We need to become new people. Yeah. Lord, we know all of our righteousness, even our best deeds, are like filthy rags before you. So we desperately need your atonement, your blood atonement, Yeshua. We cannot atone for our own sins by bringing a sacrifice. For you, Yeshua, are our once and for all final atonement sacrifice. So Lord, once we've applied the, your blood to the doorposts of our heart, Lord, now teach us how to live for you, uh, how to walk in the fruit of the spirit of goodness, how to love our neighbor, to do justice and love mercy, how to love you, Lord, with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, how to walk humbly before our Lord. Lord, help us each day. Help me each day, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll pray this. Help me, Lord, to be more fervent in prayer. To constantly practice your presence throughout the day. To intentionally consider how my every action and my every speech might glorify you. To continually thank you for my blessings. Every day, Lord, to avoid proud thoughts. Avoid comparing myself to others. 
Help me to admit my wrongs freely and speedily. To put to death all unkind thoughts. To put to death all unkind words. To focus on my neighbor's needs and not my own. To not twist or spin the truth. To guard my tongue. To trust in you, Lord, for my every need. And to redeem the time, for the days are short. And we pray this all in your holy name, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.